Welcome, guys and gals, to the 72nd episode of the Curve the Cube podcast. Curve the Cube is uh, intended to inspire you to pursue your dreams and really do something that you're passionate about with your life, um, whether it's full time, part time, as a hobby, whatever it is. Find something you love and make sure you do it. So, yay for Curve the Cube. And I'm your host, Jemmy from Flintstone Media. So thank you and welcome to another episode. And this episode uh, features Barry Bonzak, who is part of the Orion Alto program planning and integration team. Basically, he works for Lockheed Martin. And Lockheed Martin is contract, contracted to help build NASA's, okay, this is really, really exciting, so I'm tripping over my words, contracted to help build NASA's Orion spacecraft, and Orion is NASA's deep spacecraft, it's headed next, on its next mission to the dark side of the moon, to test, no, this isn't some Pink Floyd reference, but it's headed there to test human capability of, of survival on longer missions. And then, a longer deep space missions, and then it's going to head to Mars! So it's completely cool and amazing and awesome and all things, uh, insert phenomenal words here <laughs> that I have Barry on this podcast. I'm so super excited. We talk about the history of NASA, how he managed to live his dream of, of working there, how we both were young astronautics and Lego geeks, and what the real benefits are to society uh, that we gain from space exploration. Spoiler alert, loads and loads of technological advances. Um, basically, a lot of things that you and I take for granted every day would not exist, or at least would not exist yet, if we hadn't had the pushes that uh, NASA, na NASA forced us into by what we wanted to do with space exploration. So it's really, really cool. He started in into being into space and sciencey things at a very young age and realized that there was a path for him through business and he parlayed that into a career that has eventually landed him at the Kennedy Space Center. So it's a huge dream come true for him, huge dream come true for me just to have him on my podcast. Um, we first met at the first robotics competition a few weeks ago where I was there to support my previous Curve the Cube kids guest, the Poinciana Elementary School Tazbots, yay Tazbots, from episode 70, so rewind and listen to them too, amazing kids. And he was there as an ambassador to the program, uh, specifically for the first robotics competition. Um, so it's a really cool program. Uh, if your kids are into STEM learning, uh, check out First Robotics. They're pretty amazing. And so is Barry. He's a lovely guy. And not only did he shed some light on the budgetary concerns and considerations of the space program that can come into play, but he also gave me a fresh perspective on one of my favorite categories of movies, sci-fi movies. And we totally went on a whole tangent about our favorite sci-fi movies. Oh, it was great. I loved it. Uh, listen, Curvis, I've wanted someone involved with NASA on my podcast since day one. So this was every bit of a treat that I could have imagined it to be. So so thank you so much to, to Barry again for, for being on, on the podcast. It was, it was really just so lovely. Um, Please follow him at uh, Bonzac on Twitter, B-O-N-Z-A-C-K, right on Twitter. Um, a quick note, we may have accidentally mixed up Scott and Mark Kelly's names. Um, it was Scott that just came back from space, not Mark, but what do you want from us? They're twins. <laughs> I'm sure we're not the first ones to make that mistake. So we may have mixed up Scott and Mark's names, but anyways. Um... Moving on, this episode of Curve the Cube is sponsored by Big Brain 2, No Hard Feelings Tattoo Shop, uh, owned and led by legendary tattoo artist and personal friend, Chris Blinston. Um, you may have most recently caught Chris Blinston on the uh, uh, season six of Ink Master. He was the second runner-up and just did an amazing job. He should have won, in my opinion, but... To each his own, and the past is the past, it's time to move on. But, head into a shop, experience a different level of tattooing. Mention Curve for Cube and you'll get 10% off. And go check out his episode, because he was also on the show, uh, episode 31. And, um, great guy, great episode. You'll learn a lot about tattooing and what it takes to make it in as a business owner, too. So, lots to that episode as well. 
Uh, thank you again to DJ John Hitta for my music bed. Follow Curve the Cube on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, Tumblr. I think I got them all. And with that, I will say over and out because it seems somewhat, for some reason, appropriate. <laughs> and enjoy this. Sit back and relax. Enjoy the 72nd episode of the Curve of the Cube podcast with Barry Bonsack. Yay, enjoy. Curve the Cube will now initiate. Oh, it's Barry. Hey, Barry. Hey, I am sorry for being late. I was going from uh, Orlando to Titusville. <laughs> Okay, really, don't even worry about it. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Sorry about that. Yes, I can. Today is the 31st anniversary or 35th anniversary of the first space flight, uh, of the space shuttle. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You came yep. in with some so facts. SPS-1 was 1980, April 9, 1981. Oh, well, this was definitely meant to be, for sure, the state of, of, of talking, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Listen, uh, well, first, just a quick note to my listeners. Um, this is a phone podcast, so it might sound a little different, feel a little different, but um, it's so worth it. I've been wanting to have uh, a scientist who's involved with NASA grace my podcast literally since day one. So, <laughs> Barry, thank you so much for, for being on and being a guest. I, I'm so excited for this, for this podcast. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and in, in particular, it was uh, a real treat just in how we, we met because, um, so, you know, I was, we met at the first robotic competition, and um, I was there to support my last uh, Curve the Cube kids guest, the Tazbots from Point Siena Elementary, and, and check out their robotic Lego display because I've been a huge Lego fan as long as I can remember. And um, I have to tell you as a side note that the first, Lego minifigures I ever owned were astronauts. <laughs> Excellent. Did you have, like, the Benny from the Lego movie, Benny? Oh, I do. I have, you know, a blue one, a white one, a yellow one. Like, I have a whole bunch Perfect. somewhere in my storage unit. So I totally, totally have uh, a, a little collection of them. So, uh, old school, like originals from the 80s. So. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the last time um, I was ever at... Kennedy Space Center, uh, it was like middle school, I went there for space camp as part of the Young Astronauts Club, <laughs> and, cool. and so that, yes, that would have been like the early 90s, you know, what what have been some of the big changes and advances in the space program, I know you haven't been involved since all the way back then, but what have been... Right, you know, you it's know, actually kind of funny, some, that was when I was in college before I started working at Lockheed Martin, that's actually what I did through college, I worked at the Camp Kennedy Space Center. Uh, no kidding. About, yeah, that's exactly what I did while I was in college before uh, uh, graduating and hopping on to Lockheed Martin. No way, no way. So how? So you you've been able to witness some of the advancements and the changes um, even before right. you you came on board. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, my job used to be to tell people about how awesome at what the time was when I was in college, what the Constellation program was, uh, and that was. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, since been canceled and kind of remorphed into uh, the SLS rocket, which is going to carry the Orion uh, spacecraft um, up into mm -hmm. space into a, a deeper space destination other than just low Earth orbit. Um, so what we've been doing basically throughout the shuttle program was all low low Earth orbit um, different missions, including building the International Space Station, trying to figure out how long. Uh, people can survive in space. Uh, that's not exactly a right. good synopsis of the mission, but that is one of the most recent things that we're doing. We just had Mark Kelly come back from uh, the International Space Station, uh, as living there a full year in space, and now we're just kind of uh, checking to see how, how he's doing after that, And uh, because eventually we're going to have to go deeper uh, into space, and if we have to go to Mars, there's a good probability you have to go from um, the Earth gravity to no gravity, mm -hmm. spend a long mm -hmm. time in space, then you go to one-third mm -hmm. gravity on Mars, you're going to be there for maybe six months, then you go back to no gravity, and then come back here to right. one, and we're just not sure how that kind of stress, how a human body is going to handle that kind of stress. Um, right. But let's see, so like with some Mark of the other... Kelly, I know that when, oh, I was going to say, with Mark Kelly, when he came back, because he has a, a twin brother, 
So they, you know, they're able to do like kind of an A-B test with the two of them. And I know that Mark Kelly grew a couple of inches when he, over his year in space, just because of the lack of gravity. And I think it's now, he's now kind of compressed back down, but I thought yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, I, I heard about you know, that too. That's like kind that. of a common thing that happens with astronauts, the uh, spine elongates and then yeah. gravity compresses back. <laughs> Yeah, that's something that we're still trying <laughs> so to... crazy. I, I hear the, the medical um, people were still trying to figure that out because the compression part actually caused some back problems for the astronauts after they oh. returned. Yeah, I, I yeah. I don't know that Mark Kelly yeah. has, but I, I heard that that actually is something that some of the astronauts have had some trouble with is the recompression of the spine. If it doesn't compress just properly, that's going to get back problems. Right, we'll right, that makes sense. Right, and then I also heard, um, you know, speaking of medical science and, and, and its involvement in NASA, that they're going to start growing, like, different, I don't know if it's fungi or fun, fungi, however you, you, you say it, but different, right. you know, drugs um, on the ISS in order to, like, facilitate these future really, really long space travel expeditions and and the needs of the astronauts on these on these trips and i just thought that was that was so neat you know like you know i think what's awesome about the space program in in its entirety over its its whole history is all the technology and advancements and things that we've had that they've had to do in order just to uh, accomplish what needed to be accomplished but then on the flip side as well like everything that that the actual explorations and research has actually allowed us, well, not us, I have nothing to do with it, but allowed right, right, right. The, the, and doctors. The human, humankind, to humankind. The, like, right, right, <laughs> humankind to accomplish on the flip side, too. It's, it's, I mean, can you, can you I- explain to my listeners a little bit of the significance of, of NASA and space ex- exploration and all the, the research that, that people have been able to do over the years? Sure. The whole point of going into space is to improve life back on Earth. We're not just going out there for, you know, the, the joy of astronauts being able to do tumbles and the fun things that you see them do in videos, throw food <laughs> right. around. That, that, that isn't the purpose of the space program. So one of the cool things the space station also has been doing is there, like you mentioned, you can grow fungus, but growing crystals is a really cool thing that you can do in space. Hmm. They can't do quite like that in Earth because they grow a little bit differently. And the fact that they grow mm-hmm. differently means that you can uh, create medicines in space that you can't create on Earth. So we're just doing research on no that. No way. Uh, you, can, you can also grow different uh, things to make better superconductors. If we can make better superconductors, that means we can make faster computers. If you can make faster computers, wow. that will affect everything. I mean, um, the advances that we made back in the Apollo program, we were using mm-hmm. resistors mm-hmm. for things. The, the technology that we needed to get to the moon when John F. Kennedy said we need, we're going to the moon didn't exist at that time. Right. So we had right. uh, four uh, funding into it to make that happen. Well, what we got out of it was just huge technological advances that advanced um, technology uh, – that's, that's poor sense – huge technological advances uh, that we're still <laughs> benefiting from today, including the computers. So the computers at the time were just awful. Uh, compared to right. what they became at the end of the program. And that sped up basically what I doubt that that would have, um, we would have had that type of technology if you just let normal market for- forces work. Um, and I, I, I'm trying to think, I'm, I want to give a number here, but I don't want to be quoted on because I haven't done any research on it specifically. But let's just say that that advanced right, right. Uh, technology for computer sciences about 15 years into the future just from that small little investment that we had wow. for the space program so we could advance program. I mean, we, we basically came up with the semiconductors uh, that allowed us uh, to be able to go from uh, the Earth to the moon. And if you take that same technology mm-hmm. and apply it to other places, you start getting uh, better computers. I mean, we were doing vacuum tubes. At the beginning of the program, we were doing the resistors and vacuum tubes. At the end of this program, we had computing computers. And if wow. we didn't make that investment, think about that. We would, I'm not saying we would still be doing vacuum tubes today. Of course, eventually it would have advanced and caught up. And, right, uh, right, but right. But I don't right, think we'd be right. there yet. So if, let's say it, it put certainly us kick-started 15, it. Exactly. So let's say it put us 15 years into the future. From If we didn't do the space program, we'd be back 15 years. So what would that mean we would be today if we were set back 15 years? Well, about 15 years ago, I, that was 2001. In 2001, mm-hmm. I remember 
um, people were just starting to get their cell phones. Cell phones did not have right. the internet on them yet. Uh, right. Fifteen back years in the future, the internet was invented in the 1990s. Well, the internet would have been just invented about ten years ago. There would be right. no tablets. There'd be no, uh, you know, just think about everything that the information has just exploded. The information age exploded in the 1990s, and that would have just started mm-hmm. happening in the 2000s. And, like, we would still not have, like, smartphones today without that investment. So I'm wondering if we decided to do the Apollo program or something similar today, not go to the moon, but pick your next mission, whatever it is that will mm-hmm. advance the most, put us another 15 years into the future from that investment, what is that going to get us? Right. Right. I mean, you, you mentioned um, the ability to build, build better resistors, for example, in space. Is that is that exclusively because of the lack of gravity, or is it also because of the, so they're either, able to do things yeah, in a vacuum environment? Two, two different things. What they're doing on the space station today is they're working on uh, researching different crystals, which will help to build uh, new types of semiconductors and that sort of thing. And I, I can't mm-hmm. even speak about that because that has nothing to do with what I do. This is what I've read. I'm telling you this from, <laughs> from a, read from other other sources just because I'm a geek and I'm interested in it. Um, that's great. Yeah, but um, what? so that's one thing that we're doing today. But going from resistors to computers is something that they did from uh, when they announced you know, NASA became... Uh, an organization from normal, it used to be an Air Force, and then they went to uh, NASA, uh, went from NACA to NA, NASA. Um, and from that point to when we landed on the moon, we were doing resistors around the Mercury spacecraft, and the computing power wasn't up to par at the time. So from mm-hmm. um, 1961 to 1969, huge huge computer advancements happened. And that was here on Earth mm-hmm. where that happened. That wasn't in, We didn't go in space and then build new computers. All that advancement right, happened right. here on Earth. Right, right. So, so touch on, the, for, I mean, because when I met you, you gave me like a, a two, three-minute rundown of everything you're involved in, uh, both professionally and in your free time that has to do with space and science and, and everything, all that interest. Can you can you give give that rundown again? Yeah, sure. Okay, so what I've been sharing with you so far up to this point uh, has all just been things that I'm interested in that I read about, not necessarily anything that I actually have any impact on. Uh, yeah. My job, uh, I work at Lockheed Martin at the Kennedy Space Center. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm on the Orion program. So I wasn't a part of the space shuttle or the Apollo program or any of that, but uh, I work on the Orion program, and I'm mm-hmm. a program planner. I meet with the uh, engineers, and I help them basically with their schedules and their budgets, and engineers don't like doing either of those two things, so that makes me the least popular person <laughs> in the building. Um, but basically, if you ever, uh, you know, it's really important to try to stay on budget and on schedule, because right now we're not launching people into space from American soil. It's every, everybody that goes into space is going from uh, Russia right now. We've got to send our astronauts over to Russia. Right. So. One of the big things right. Congress wants is to reestablish our space program. So they have uh, uh, the Orion for Deep Space, and they have the CST-100 Starliner by Boeing, which will be a commercial crew which will taxi people from America to the space station. And then we have SpaceX, which is their Dragon capsule, which will also take people from uh, the from Earth to the space station. So the two commercial crew is going to be doing basically mm-hmm. the task the space shuttle used to do, uh, be low Earth orbit. Uh, we have invested enough tax dollars into the space station, into learning how to get to and from Earth orbit to where we feel comfortable that we can spend that technology off to the commercial sector. What we have not okay. done yet to where is deep space. We did it with the Apollo program, but only a few missions, but we are definitely not, we have not gotten to the point where it's safe enough to let commercial start going and do that, and quite frankly, to take so much investment that if you don't have tax dollars and the government investing in the big missions, mm-hmm. you're not going to have a private company that is going to do their financial analysis on it to say, yes, this is going to be something that is going to eventually generate profit. But mm-hmm, there are mm-hmm. definitely things out there. And I, but one of the things I like doing, I am I have a finance major from the University of Central Florida. I like to relate things mm-hmm. back to people so they can understand why is it that we need to invest in this. Um, right. So, 
Yeah, one of the big arguments is we are destined for space. It's our manifest destiny. Humankind eventually needs to leave the planet Earth and go populate the rest of the solar system. Uh, the other uh, thing that you tell people is that uh, we are explorers by nature. You know, we left, uh, you know, all of Americo Despucci, Christopher Columbus, uh, Lewis and Clark, all the explorers, it's, just, it's in our blood to explore. But the problem with those right. arguments is that when you have to tell people um, about the... Uh, tell people, yeah, I'm sorry that you're unable to eat, but we want to invest all this money in the space program. It kind of falls right. on deaf ears at that point if somebody, if a family is struggling to survive. What people do right, understand right. is if we invest in this, it's going to create much, much larger uh, products and things that are going to help your life, and it's going to give you give the country as a whole more wealth than what we had invested in this. And that is mm -hmm. just the very basic economics is for anything. You want to invest in things that will create more wealth, not less. Right. So right, right. the Orion spacecraft is our deep space solution. And we're going to be... Can, you, can uh, I ask you real quick, Kit, what, what actually qualifies as deep space? Anything that is low, or anything that isn't low Earth orbit, if we're going to a destination other than the Earth. Okay. So the moon qualifies as deep space. For the moment. I mean... Or not. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The moon is going to be a training ground for deeper space. So, but it's not low Earth orbit. So that is a good, good point. Um, the other spacecraft, the uh, Boeing Starliner and the SpaceX Dragon, will not be going to the moon. They just are. Mm -hmm. They're not contracted to be technologically advanced to do so. Uh, the Orion spacecraft can, and okay. it will be. Okay. On our, our next, our next mission is going to um, uh, go around the moon. Yeah, I, I I read up on it that it's going to be going to the dark side of the moon, um, which just from my perspective sounds completely horrifying. I <laughs> can't imagine because it's supposed yeah. to be a, a manned a manned mission, right? It the first uh, oh, let's see, we've had one Orion launch so far. This will be our second Orion launch. It will be unmanned. Mm -hmm. The next mission okay. after that will repeat the same mission that we're going to have which, by the way, is not very long from now. Right now we're in 2016. I tell people it's in 2018, but they're like, oh, I've actually had people say, oh, I'm not going to live that long. I'm like, that's in two years. Uh, <laughs> we are in 2016, folks. Uh, we are launching in 2018, and then after that we're going to be launching again, and uh, I don't have the exact launch date, but it's in the 2020s with people on it. Mm -hmm. That's going to repeat the uh, EM-1, Exploration Mission 1, is what is going to go, and we're not going to stay in orbit, but we're going to do two um, maneuvers 30,000 feet away from the moon, which is further than any human rated spacecraft has ever done before. So it'll be further from Earth any human space human rated wow. spacecraft has ever gone. And then it's going to come back. And then we're going to put people on it for the next mission, EM2, Exploration Mission 2, to go do the same thing. Um, and the goal is right now we are uh, going, NASA is going to go send a uh, unmanned spacecraft to an asteroid in the asteroid belt. They're going mm -hmm. to pluck a boulder off of that asteroid and they're going to put it in orbit around the moon, a 30,000 foot orbit around the moon. So what we're mm -hmm. practicing for right now is one, getting our spacecraft ready for people. Then we're going to get ready mm -hmm. for, uh, for the maneuver that we need to complete this mission. So that asteroid is going to be 30,000 foot orbit around the moon. We're going to put an Orion spacecraft in that same orbit, rendezvous with it, and then we're going to study that asteroid and be bring pieces of that back to Earth. And why is that important? Mm. Well, a couple, mm -hmm. couple of reasons. Uh, if you remember back in, I think it was 2003, uh, just a rogue asteroid came and it exploded above Russia. We had no idea it was coming. Yes. Don't, we didn't know yes. anything about it. It did lots of damage. Many people got hurt. And that could happen anywhere yeah. at any time. And these things actually do hit the Earth frequently, but we never hear about it because it's over unpopulated areas like the ocean. But if one of those right, did explode right. above, let's say, Los Angeles or New York City, it would cause millions of dollars of damage. Lots of people would get hurt. And we don't know mm -hmm. anything about them, how they get here. Uh, and it's a good thing that, you know, the one was small enough that didn't even hit the ground. It didn't even hit the ground. It exploded in air, and the shock wave is what did the damage. Right, right. I remember that they had, because Russia has so many of those dash cam videos, and so there were a lot of dash cam videos and footage of, of the actual event occurring. I remember that. Right. So that is one of the things that helped. Uh, this mission was already in process, but it happened to be voted on like the week after. 
you know, should we go do this mission? And he, at that time, we were just like, ah, yeah, go do that. <laughs> uh, but that's not the main. We want to basically learn a little bit Hello, more Barry? about that. Oh, can you still hear me? Hey, Barry. Hear me? There you go. Hey. Can you hear me this time? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that was so weird. I think we need to um, get the space program to apply some spacey new technology to conference calls. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the, the great things that came out of the Apollo program was an awesome saying that, uh, you know, if we could do blank, why can't we do why, – if we could go to the moon, why can't we do blank? So that's just one more right. thing that you can have to live. We can go to the moon, but we can't exactly. get a commerce call medal today. <laughs> Whatever it is. Exactly. But, hey, just... <laughs> hey, we're back on. We're back on. <laughs> Excellent. I believe yeah, we were, were talking, talking about, about asteroids the, and uh, the importance the of why we should go boat. study asteroids. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think we left off um, with the uh, asteroid that exploded over Russia that caused lots of damage, hurt a lot of people, and that could happen anywhere. Uh, but that's not, right. of course, the only reason. We want to know just more about the solar system itself. What are the asteroids made of? Uh, we have, from studies that we're doing here on Earth, we've pretty well figured out that there are some asteroids up there that we should go try to visit and mine resources out of. In fact, there are some commercial companies that are popping up uh, specifically to mine asteroids. And why would you want to do that? Well, for example, one asteroid that we've discovered out there has four times the amount of platinum on the one asteroid than is here wow. located on all of Earth. Platinum is wow. one of the most expensive metals there is. And it's also the metal that you use to create computer chips and semiconductors. And um, mm -hmm. if you want to create wealth, creating wealth is all about making something that is that you didn't have before. A lot of the resources that we mine, let's say the... Um, Gold. You go and you find gold, and then you bring it out from under the ground, and then you sell it to other people, and then you have created wealth. Mm -hmm. So whatever uh, money you invest in mining gold, the amount that you sell it to other people for is got to be more than the cost to go mine it. That's going to be the exact right. same economics and philosophy that is going to turn into space industry mining, is that we need to get um, our launches cost down to a point and the cost of space travel down to a point to where we can uh, generate more wealth for not necessarily our country from tax dollars, but hand it off to the commercial sector to where they can go and bring these asteroids, resource them, get the, the resources from it back to Earth that wasn't existed. We are now creating wealth for the entire planet, not just one company or one country. We have gotten resources right. that wasn't on our planet to our planet to be able to be used for something extremely useful. I mean, gold, what is the useful use for gold? You wear it on your uh, fingers and it looks pretty. The uh, platinum, that's something that is going to be actually make our computers faster or make more computers, right. and better computers. Um, right. And same thing, let's same thing with diamonds. The there's, a, there's a lot of... Um, applications for diamonds beyond just, you know, jewelry and, and, and such. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that is one excellent application for asteroids. Let's shift it over to the moon because, that, you know, asteroids is one thing that we're doing. Um, there's also, you know, people, there's a lot of discussion. Should we be going to asteroids? Should we be going to the moon? Should we be going to Mars? Um, mm -hmm. The moon has a very interesting uh topic because there's a, a couple things there. We believe that there could be some frozen uh, water maybe on the moon. Uh, there, there could be some mm. water ice there on the moon. Uh, there could be hydrogen on the moon. If We haven't discovered it yet, but we are pretty certain it's there. And if we discover that there's hydrogen there, that means the cost mm -hmm. of going to the moon is significantly less uh, than any projection that is currently out there until, you know, that if there wasn't, if there was, that means, okay, we now have the ability to mine hydrogen. There's even a possibility of something mm. called hydrogen-3, which I do not know everything about hydrogen-3, but it's something that could be used as an energy source that is better than oil uh, if we go mm. and get it and bring it back here. Well, let's say there isn't hydrogen-3, but there is just hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen-3 can't be formed on the Earth because of vacuums and low gravity and that sort of thing. I, like I said, I'm not a chemist. I don't quite fully understand it, but that's definitely a topic you, sh you should go look into. Um, right. Let's say there's just hydrogen. If there is hydrogen, that means we now have something that we can use, a resource on the moon that we can convert into water. We now have a resource on the moon that we can mine and convert into rocket fuel to leave the moon. We don't have to bring our own hydrogen anymore. Um, right. And with that, that makes the cost of going to the moon very inexpensive comparatively. 
uh, where if we were to bring everything, anything that you bring from Earth, you got to launch into space. And the cost of launching something into space is the biggest part of the cost. Uh, it, like the Apollo rocket, the Saturn V rocket, it was 363 foot tall. You know, very little mm-hmm. bit of that rocket was the Apollo spacecraft that actually went to the moon. And then of, of that mm-hmm. Apollo spacecraft that went to the moon, you know, the only part that held people was just the uh, crew module, not the service module. Uh, so the more that you put into space, the larger the cost exponentially to get it up there. Anything that you can go mm-hmm. to a destination where you can mine the resources and then turn it into something that you would have had to have brought from Earth reduces the cost of the entire thing. Uh, so that's it's interesting I'm- because, yeah, you're, you're tapping into one of the questions I was going to ask, which is, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I got you back. Okay. Um, I was gonna, yeah, I was I was curious about the bigger some of the bigger challenges from um, an engineering or financial standpoint, trying to send you know some soft fleshy human bodies into space and then return right. them safely to Earth still alive. Um, you know that's considerations beyond just mechanics at that point. Um, I can only imagine what those challenges look like. Right. Yeah, and a lot of that depends on what is the mission. So right now the mission, mm-hmm. like I said, is going into uh, orbit around the moon, rendezvousing with an asteroid, bringing, doing science and doing, bringing science back to Earth. That is, for the human body, I think we've pretty much got that figured out. It's not going to be more taxing than the, the space station mission. It's going to be about 29 days. 29 days is nothing for mm-hmm. you know, what we've developed and the research that we've done through the Apollo and space shuttle and... International Space Station. We check mark. We've got that. Um, the, some of the technological advances are some of the things. So we believe that we have all the technology already exists to go do this. We just need the funding, and funding being right. coming from Congress. Interesting. So, yeah. so what do you to, think, to do a mission um, like that? There, there's mm-hmm. no big, you know, there's nothing I can see. Putting something in orbit around the moon and go sending someone up there, we've we got to develop a spacecraft to go do it. But all the technology that, in order to do that already exists. Interesting, interesting, because we've made so many advances already in all of those, right. in all the fields that come together to, to get that kind of a thing done. That's, that's, that's interesting. I really didn't know that, that, that we had come that far, that um, not, not to say it's old hat, but that all the technology already exists. For, for doing something like that. That's, that's pretty amazing. Right. Now, if we start talking about right. things about building a base on the moon or building a base on Mars, th- there's going to be some mm-hmm. technologies we need to develop to make that happen. Although I have read articles and other people have suggested that, oh, yeah, we could do that within 10, you know, uh, not 10 years. We're planning on doing that by the 2030s. But people are saying, oh, yeah, if we give us enough money, we could do that right now. No new technologies to be developed. That's not necessarily true. There's going to be some things that we've got to figure out. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I'm going to say probably 80%, you know, rough guess, 80% of the technologies for us to go from Earth to Mars already exist, and we've got to develop 20% wow. of it. Wow, that's crazy to me. That is so crazy to need, me. We <laughs> just need the funding. Need the funding. We got the people. What do you, what do you we think? Need, we, got, we, yeah. we got the people. We got the smart people to figure it out. We just need the funding. Yeah. What do you think? Because um, you're a pretty young guy. What do you think? What do you think is is unique about the millennial perspective or, or influence on the space program and the thought processes that go into what we can and and will do? You know, that is an excellent question, um, and that's a really hard one to answer because I am not entirely sure what all the millennials think about the space program as a whole. I can tell you what myself and my friends <laughs> right. think living at the Kennedy Space Center. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But what do I believe that we're going to accomplish? I think the Mars generation, at the Mars Gen, uh, it's a Twitter account um, that is an amazing group that basically all the people that are between the ages, of, I think, like 16 and 30, I'm not entirely sure, 30-something, um, all got <laughs> together and discussing different things. And, you know, they're really good about social media as opposed to previous generations don't understand why social media even exists or why they need to use it. Right, right. Uh, but th- right. Th- there's a lot of idea sharing going on and a lot of inspiration happening over the Internet that never happened before. A lot of, uh, you know, th- when we launched um, Orion Exploration Flight Test 1 back in December uh, 5th, 2014, mm-hmm. uh, not, not very long ago, uh, we had 4 billion 
tweets and Twitters and hashtags, hashtag Journey to the Mars, wow. hashtag I'm on board, hashtag Orion, at NASA underscore Orion. Um, the, there's, we had four billion people talking about it at one time, wow. and that has never happened before. So right. I am extremely excited for the SLS rocket launch and uh, eventually EM-1 and then EM-2 with people on it because that is going to just explode. In fact, we were talking about for the next EM-1 launch, there's going to be 100,000 people that is going to come to the Space Coast to see it, kind of similar to um, the last shuttle launch. There's 100,000 people that come to see the very last mm-hmm. shuttle launch. Well, that's going to start up again. Uh, and then when we wow. start putting people on it, who knows? That is like taking uh, – here in Florida – our largest stadium, I believe, is the football stadium in Gainesville for the Gators. They can hold uh, – it has seating capacity for 80-something thousand, but standing room only that can hold 90,000 people. If you empty mm-hmm. that entire stadium at standing room only and then add 10,000 more people, that is how many people are coming to watch this launch. Wow, coming that's up. incredible. Yeah, coming up in 2018. Hopefully I'll be one of them. At the end of 2018. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll definitely be there. There is no doubt in my mind I will be uh, did you but, ever watch you know, a shuttle kind of, launch when you were a kid? I did, actually. And I lived in Oklahoma when I was growing up. And my uh, my, <laughs> my parents are you know, huge into space and technology, which is great because they aren't even, you know, they're not scientists or engineers. My dad works at a bank. Um, mm-hmm. and, but as a kid, his dad, uh, they didn't live exactly in a um, – rich area or anything like that. They, they were one of the few families that had a black and white television at the time of the Apollo moon landing. And his dad brought wow. in their TV and sat it in their class so they could, uh, the entire class could witness the moon landing. Uh, so wow. that impacted him when he was in grade school. And ever since then, he's mm-hmm. been, uh, when a, my brother and I were growing up, we uh, went with my dad to business um, meetings that he had in different cities. We went to all the different cities, science museums. Um, and then when there's a shuttle launch, we actually tried uh, to uh, organize our some of our vacations, coming to Disney and going to the beach with when a shuttle launch might mm-hmm. be. So I got to see some as a kid. No kidding. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, at the time, you know, living in Oklahoma, you just go, wow, that's really cool. Too bad we don't have anything like that in my state. Um, right, right, right. But that, that definitely, definitely is just one more thing. And I remember um, at the end of one of our vacations when I was probably seven, uh, my parents were asking, you know, what was your favorite thing that we did in Florida? And that includes going to the beach, going to Universal Studios when Universal Studios was like brand new. Um, right. Going to Disney. And I remember saying, the Kennedy Space Center was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't even remember exactly what it was, but I, I think we got to, like, me and the astronaut all over there. They got to, you know, they have the IMAX movie. Um, God, and the, yeah, the totally. stuff that they have there today is so much cooler than even what they had back then. The, uh, the Atlanta yeah. Space the Atlanta Space Shuttle it has a fantastic exhibit that the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex has built around it that it gets to stay indoors and uh, oh the God. free show that they have to it and the Saturn V rocket that they have there it is just a really cool place. Uh, extremely wow. inspirational. But goodness sakes, the most inspirational thing you can ever do for your kids is bring them to a launch. Even if it isn't a shuttle launch, there's people on it. We're only launching rockets, unmanned rockets right now, but just seeing the flames and fire and looking at something yeah. the last time that's here on the planet that for the rest of its life is going to be in space. It's an inspirational yeah. thing for a kid. And I encourage all people, whatever it is, bring your kid to go see a launch. It will change their lives. Absolutely. Yeah, it opens up it opens up your imagination to another whole nother level. You know, I think I, I, I have a four year old and um I just took him uh for his fourth birthday we took him to Disney Disney World for the first time. And there's something about seeing seeing a whole different level of technology, even if even though you don't at that age know what that word is or have ever heard that word, I have a concept of it, but seeing something brand new that you've never seen does something to your imagination. It elevates it to a whole nother level, you know, whether it's, um, uh, you know, the different, I mean, the Disney World is just doing some incredible things. Epcot's doing some incredible, well, not, they really need an upgrade, but they have done some incredible yeah. things. And to him, and to him, it was, it was just mind blowing. And so, and I think that's what it, that's similar to what, you know, seeing a shuttle launch to do, except, there's no magic involved. It's 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 real. It's tangible. It's, right. And and right. to think that you're that the shuttle is going into 
space and now you start thinking what is that and and imagining right. you know life beyond our planet and and the stars in a different way it's it's it really does transform your thinking i agree 100 percent. absolutely yeah that inspiration to kids is the most important thing that one that we can do because they're going to be the people that eventually are going to be going and doing these things that we're trying to set up right now so we're building this right spacecraft for us eventually to go deeper into space while the first person right. that, lives, that is going to put their first feet on mars is living oh. right now they are yes. kids somewhere you know between the ages of like five and fifteen um yeah. You know, with, within that range. And whenever I meet students, I tell them that. Just, hey, do you guys know, realize that the first person to step on Mars is going to have the same notoriety, same fame, same household name as Neil Armstrong? That person throughout history yeah. is going to be a legend. They are alive yeah. right now, somewhere. Yeah. And, you know, if, when I meet oh, groups oh, of. Ahead. When I meet groups of girls, I like to also tell them that there was recently a uh, study done by NASA that the, you know, if you were to send a crew of all men or crew of all female, which would be better, um, and it's probably mm -hmm. going to be a mix, but if, let's just in the scenario where you can send only men or only female, what would be the better solution? And they came up mm -hmm. with, well, they believe that the task would be done perfectly fine, uh, so the mission is going to be accomplished the same either way. But it would mm -hmm. actually be less expensive to send uh, the female astronauts because it mm. takes less energy to make a female body run and take a male uh, body, which means oh, they need to consume yeah, less yeah, yeah. food. If you consume less food, that means you need to launch less food. If you need to launch less food, that is a weight savings on the right, uh, right. SLS rocket. Huh. Interesting, and, and and less of a of a of a need of of resources on the other side. You know, once you are where you are, you know, if you're talking about um, building a structure on Mars or where have you, that is going to be you know a research facility or something like that, and having people be housed there at some point, you know, then go go girls because we don't need as much. As yeah, girls in STEM. That's uh, it's, it's important. Yeah, it's absolutely important. And you know, it's kind of sad that I look at some of the statistics on uh, majors across the United States. You know, it's like STEM majors, seventeen percent female. In some colleges, yeah. there's some colleges that brag that they have one of the highest in the state, seventeen percent females attending their college in the major. I'm just like seventeen yeah. percent when you're in high school. You know, girls. Uh, it's been pretty well proven across. Uh, all statistics uh, done on the research that girls are just as good as science and technology and math and all the yeah. tests as boys are. And I remember even in high school that, you know, there's, they were obviously, I mean, there's no real difference in the human brain. It is girl brain, mm -hmm. boy brain. When you're doing math and science, it's the same thing. Uh, right, right. When you get to college, 17% of the people are the people that are going to be changing on technology, making products. Uh, advancing us into the future, what kind of resource are we missing out of as a world and as right. a nation Big by time. not encouraging females to go into STEM careers? Big time. And and actually, that was what um, was part of what jazzed me up so much in talking to Natasha and Morgan, who are the two the two girls I spoke with on, on that, that Lego team from Point Scan Elementary, is just seeing their passion for coding and, and engineering and robotics and, and building something and their commitment to it and their focus. And I just was, I was so proud of, of right. them and what that meant for, for their generation and, and, you know, humanity as a whole, that kids like this, uh, girls like them are, are, are just that jazzed. I mean, it, it was really something, something to witness. And I, um, I thought it was interesting how the kids were just gathered around you, um, like soaking in <laughs> your aura and your wisdom. <laughs> you know, what were some of the uh, things um, there, that, was that awesome you were talking group. to them about? The Tazbox yeah. uh, first Lego League team from Point Siena High School, as you That's mentioned. Great. A fantastic mm -hmm. group of kids. All the uh, first Lego League kids and first tech challenge and first robotics competitions. Uh, I might as well throw out for first Lego League junior. Those are the, the four... Yeah. Um, first leagues, I'll say, that I um, volunteer with. Um, yeah. And, yeah, the kids just love meeting people 
from the Kennedy Space Center. And it's kind of funny because I remember when I was a student, I actually started out as a student on a first robotics competition team. Um, mm -hmm. And I was extremely inspired by Dean Kamen, the founder of FIRST. He's also the inventor of the Segway and uh, many medical oh, inventions yeah. like an insulin pump. And he's now working on a slingshot, which is a water purifier that you can mobilize and take to a remote area. It'll produce its own electricity, but then purify any polluted no water source nearby. You just need to stick its one end into something that is wet, and out the other end will become drinking water that's no like way. medical grade. Yeah, pure oh medical water that you can the, for the entire village. Must be able to pump oh. out enough to, uh, for, oh man, I'm trying to, basically the entire village to be able to drink clean water. Wow. So he, that's what he's working on, uh, and I was extremely inspired by him, but another person's name was Dave Lavery. Um, and he is one of the heads of the uh, of NASA at the, uh, Washington, D.C. for anything that leaves planet Earth and lands on another planet. So all Curiosity, uh, the Curiosity rover, Spirit, Opportunity, before that you mm -hmm, had Sojourner. Mm -hmm. um, he was one of the lead people in all of those uh, space missions uh, to Mars. And I was able to meet him. I asked him for signatures, and it was just fantastic being able to talk to him. And I remember like, being able to just talk to him was one of the first things that goes, yeah. how cool is this guy? I want to be more like yeah. that guy. <laughs> what, what do I need yeah. to do to be like that guy? <laughs> so, what did you think uh, you were going to be when you grew up? What did you, what did you dream of? What did but, you want to do? So before first robotics competition, uh, I started doing the first robotics competition in my junior year of high school. Uh, before uh -huh. that, I did the science fair, um, and I was actually doing my science fair project in the math and um, the math category, it's like math and something else category, and I did mm -hmm. it on the stock market, and I did a, lots and lots of analysis on the stock market for the science fair project. So that was just kind of my lead into science. Uh, you know, I, I didn't learn much about technology or science my, you know, all through middle school other than things that we did with as a family. And there's not, not a mm -hmm. whole lot of exposure at that time. Um, mm -hmm. And that eventually, you know, I started watching robot battle shows on TV. Um, and I thought, oh, wow, well, robots are kind of cool. So then my junior year yeah. in high school, I was at Florida, uh, announced that they're creating a robotics team. And I was just like, okay, yeah, let's go do that. So I joined the robotics <laughs> team. And, you know, it's kind of funny. I wasn't thinking much of it. I was planning on being a banker like my dad is, or possibly going in, and even through college, um, on the robotics team itself, we don't, they don't just try to turn every single person into an engineer. It, and every single person that uh, gets on a robotics team isn't going to go into engineering. That's fine. We want to mm -hmm. pull in as many people as possible to be exposed to science and technology, even if they go off and do other things. You still want business people right. to understand why science and technology is important. You want people that go off to do um, all the other industries, medical, whatever it is, they just need to understand science and technology is important, and I want to support it. Um, right, right. But, so I was the person that uh, filled out grant information. I helped organize our outreach events in the community. Uh, I helped with um, organizing the team itself, creating the T-shirts, all the little business things. I learned I was really, really good at the business aspect of our robotics team. And then not so much at the building because some of my friends, of course, had parents that were carpenters or, uh, you right, know, or right, mechanics. Right. Or, and they were really, really good at building the robot. At that time, I was a junior in high school. I'd already gotten to a point in my life where I thought I was doing business. I did the business things on the team. But I got exposed to all this robot stuff and meeting all these amazing people. <laughs> I was like, wow, yeah. I'm going into business still. But check out all this really cool stuff that I had no idea anything about. So I went to college. Yeah. Uh, I think that was actually at one point. Um, I, I was out trying to do research. We, we made it to the world championship and I was trying to find people to sponsor our school to help us go to the world championship. Uh, I did a presentation at the school board and at the time, um, I was in Harmony, Florida and the Harmony development company, mm -hmm. uh, had somebody that was sitting at the school board meeting. Um, he was, his name was, uh, Mr. Lentz and he came and said, Barry, how much money do you guys need? And I said, well, it's going to cost us $5,000 just for the entry fee, and then we need to be able to afford travel costs for, like, the hotel and the bus. So, and he's just like, whatever it is, done. Come see me on Monday. And so I brought my team wow. and said, we're, we're got, we, we got somebody to go see on Monday. Come on. 
And after that meeting, he's just like, Barry, what, you know, whatever it is you do, you need to be going into business. You, you were just have a knack of, for like no other for business, going to business. So that was the uh, moment in my life that made me go, okay, this is what I need to do. So I, I got a finance major. Uh, but at the same mm-hmm. time, all the way through getting my finance major, there's very little talk about science and technology and space for my finance major at the University of Central Florida. Uh, I was a finance major, but too, I was, so I can relate. <laughs> okay, excellent. You can relate. Excellent. Um, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, through that, I, I went from being a student on a team to being a volunteer for the competitions and a mentor for the local robotics teams, one being in Orlando, Exploding Bacon is their name, and uh, just an amazing <laughs> group of people that I was – fortunate enough to spend many time with and some of the mentors for Exploding Bacon came from places like Lockheed Martin. Uh, wow. And through that, as I started becoming a senior in college, they said, hey, of course, all engineering companies, all science companies, any company in the world needs accountants and finance people because they deal with money. And so I, I positioned myself to where I could join any company I wanted to join. And I was working with these people mm-hmm. at Lockheed Martin on this project to help high school students build a robot and gets into a competition. So uh, they said, hey, let us help us help you set up with an interview uh, for an internship. So I got my internship my senior year of college, joined Lockheed Martin. And at this time, uh, working through college, as I mentioned, I worked at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, teaching kids about science space, with the Orion spacecraft. And I knew the Orion mm-hmm. spacecraft was made by Lockheed Martin. And even at that point, I knew I wanted to someday work on the Orion spacecraft and, and that's not many people that are getting a business degree in college are saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was a little right. unique there. Um, and so I went to Lockheed Martin. I worked at, in Orlando for about five or six years, got my MBA. And just as I finished my MBA, uh, a position opened um, at the Kennedy Space Center. And I, this isn't exactly a coincidence that that happened. I had in the rec, Lockheed Martin has, where he sends employees recs, um, rec, rec mm-hmm. positions, positions that are available, uh, and you can request them mm-hmm. to send them to your email box. And I had in there for about two years, anything that opened up at the Kennedy Space Center, email me about it. So I was looking at everything, every position that was open, the, it didn't matter what it was. I just wanted to know what kind of jobs are at the Kennedy Space Center while I was working right. at Lockheed Martin Orlando, it, which, by the way, Lockheed Martin Orlando is look, great. I love the coworkers I had there. I love the boss. I love everything about it. I just had a passion for the space program that I just had to get there. Um, yeah. So as soon as one opened, I jumped on the opportunity. Um, to come over, and it has just been, it happened to be the month before the launch of the Orion spacecraft, the very first Orion Exploration Flight wow. Test One, and I got to like within my first week, we were rolling the vehicle, you know, out of the building, the launch abort system facility <laughs> building to the launch pad. That was my first week. Wow! <laughs> and then that you know the next week after that, I got to go to the top of the launch pad and you know stand. You know, it's just no uh, sorry eyed. I just couldn't even believe I was living the dream here. I was at the top of the launch pad, um, arm's length from the <laughs> spacecraft, looking over the, the side of the launch no pad way. the ocean. And I was just like, I am here. I have arrived. I am oh never leaving. <laughs> I, I'm literally tearing up at this story. This is great. <laughs> but I can only imagine I can only imagine what that must have been like in, in that moment. Geez, that's awesome. Yeah, that was the point. The launch of the month later, that was just like, yep, this is, uh, I am here. <laughs> <laughs> you knew it. You felt it so, in your bones. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, now, now we're talking about the, the Mars gen and the millennials and things, and we're going to be putting uh, people on Mars in the 2030s. Yeah, I, I definitely plan on being here when that happens. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. Do you, so you, you mentioned at the beginning of our chat that you um, – like read a lot of of this about this stuff and 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 everything. Do you watch a lot of the science TV shows and movies and space TV shows and movies and that type of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if I can make a list <laughs> of great things to go watch, one of my favorites was From the Earth to the Moon. Uh, that okay. If you haven't seen it, go watch From the Earth to the Moon. It is a, a DVD series that goes over every single Apollo mission. And basically, if you've seen the mo- let's start with the movie Apollo 13. Have you seen the movie Apollo 13? Well, let me tell you, it's so funny that you okay. mentioned that, because I was just thinking about how um, I actually want to back up a little further, and it's going to sound weird, okay. but I'll explain why. Have you, okay. Do you remember the movie Forrest Gump? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so the movie Forrest Gump, 
also star Tom Hanks and Gary Sinise. And there right. is a scene, it's a New Year's Eve scene, when uh, Forrest Gump is first telling Gary Sinise, or I forget his name in the movie, uh, Lieutenant Dan, the, about his plan to own this, sh- to be a shrimp boat captain. And Gary, right. uh, Lieutenant Dan says to him, you become a shrimp boat captain um, the day, it, the, like, I'll become an astronaut or something like that. And it was a joke. And then the next movie they did together was Apollo 13. <laughs> I actually I was didn't just realize thinking about that. that is, today. Yeah. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, and actually, I remember watching Apollo 13 in the movie theater. Um, it was packed, and I got there, like, just before the show started. So I had no choice but to sit in the very front row, which I'd never done before in a movie. And I loved it because it was, at first a little disorienting because the way that the camera shots are and everything, it's very, you know, they they move through space literally like, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, but it was neat because it almost felt like I was inside a simulator. It was really cool. I love that. (laughs) That is my favorite movie of all time because it is a movie that not only captures the imagination and is entertaining and suspenseful, but it all actually happened. And Tom Hanks, as you know, uh, yeah. one of the directors of that movie, actually went and did things like refurbish the old Apollo simulators. They used the real simulators in the movie that were just laying around in art. Oh, no way. Not working. He actually no way. Yeah, got, them, got those things working again and shot the real ones for the movie. And they what? took the schematic for that. launch for Mission Control, and they actually made the, the set exactly like the schematics for Mission Control. They had... Um, Wow. People from the Apollo program, like Dave Scott, Apollo astronaut Dave Scott was actually one of the, the uh, consultants for the movie, and he was around on set almost every day or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. And he said that he, you know, he was walking around, and he was walking around the set of the um, launch control, and he was like, "Okay, well, if I turn over here and make a left, there will be an elevator there, because that's exactly where it was in the uh, <laughs> uh, in Houston, or <laughs> just, yeah, just so they, yeah. they worked really, really hard." make that movie wow. uh, as realistic and accurate as possible. And so, yeah, you know, I love yeah. the movie The Martian. The Martian is now my second favorite movie of all time, but it just doesn't even come close to Apollo 13. Uh, well, I was, was, was going to ask you, actually, when it comes... When it, huh? You go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> when it comes to, like, the fiction movies, like like The Martian or uh, Gravity or any, you know, Interstellar, any, any, any of the fiction stuff, um, are there are there knowing as much as you know about space and science? Are there com- common things that are wrong that that just are just cause a gripe and makes you just kind of go like roll your eyes a little, or do you still get to really Anything enjoy that it? Anything that involves people going into a black hole annoys me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> if if the sci fi revolves around going into a black hole and ain't up somewhere else, uh, right. <laughs> And you know what's funny is that, you know, that that's my gripe. But you, you can watch, there's a YouTube out there for gravity that Neil deGrasse Tyson explains the science behind gravity. And, you know, they actually try to do some science things. But I'm just like, it was just so far off. Because, like, we, we believe that there's a possibility that we could create a wormhole where you could go inside one and then end up somewhere else in the universe. But there is absolutely yeah. no way, I think, humankind will ever get to the technology to where we, first, we have to get to that other place first. And right. to get to the nearest star would take multiple generations of lifetimes just to get there. It's just, it's not going to happen. But if you go into a black <laughs> hole specifically, you, you get crushed into absolutely nothing. You get, and infinite, you get, infinite density. Exactly. Like, yeah. 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 Singularity. Yeah. And what does that mean? Who knows? But it's just anything. But then oh, the whole uh, I, I just can't even explain how annoyed I am with going into wormholes. So that's not real. Don't do that. Um, you know, I like, uh, okay, I like that movies that have... Okay, I was planning on doing it tomorrow, but I'll check that off my good, list. Good, good. Well, if you're making a... If you decide to make a movie, don't do that either, okay? Um, <laughs> anything that involves alien life, I enjoy alien movies, but just the fact that there's alien there's life in the there? movie... Do I think there's life out there? I think we need a lot more research. And if you know, one of my favorite movies is Contact. Contact is a fantastic movie, and a great quote oh, from that movie. Oh yeah, that's you know, the if, one with um, Jodie Foster. Is that the Jodie Foster one? I believe. You know what? I believe so. I'm so pop culturally cult, pop culturally challenged. I am not able to answer any actor or actor. <laughs> I, I know the name Tom Hanks. I can say Tom Hanks. Uh, but other than that, I am so lost on pop culture, uh, and I'll admit it. 
Um, but anyway, one of the great great quotes from that movie, uh, if there isn't anything else other than us out there, it's an awful waste of space. But mm. who knows? Who knows? What and about, what about that, like, that can go into about, a huge like religious conversation, too, that I'd rather not go into. But here's what we right, know. Right, right, Here right, on right, Earth, right. there is life on every single part of this planet. You can't go pick a leaf out of, or you go into the desert and not find bacteria somewhere. Anywhere that there, there is ice mm-hmm. or full of water, there is life there. And what we mm-hmm. do not know at this point is, is did, are we sitting on the jackpot winning, winning lottery ticket, and we believe all other lottery tickets are also winners because this is the only thing we know? Or is it right. that you can go to anywhere else that has water life or ice, uh, sorry, uh, liquid water or ice water or other forms that could be substitutes for water that we know water here, but maybe, you know, a pool of methane is enough to make life. Another right, place. right. I was just going to say. Is it something that inevitably happens? Yeah, and is, is life spreading across the universe? We don't know. Uh, so mm-hmm. I can't say, you know, my belief is the best knowledge that we have that I've read about and that could say yes or no either direction. And the no yeah. argument is a pretty strong argument, too, because we could be living on the winning lottery ticket of the entire universe, and we don't know it. Yeah, the yeah. You know, life um, spreading there's a, is so... Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, when, you know, it, it, it really is a pretty magnificent amount of things that went right to... Right. to garner life on this planet, a magnificent amount of things that went right. But then on the other side of the coin, there is a magnificent number of, 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 of solar of, of systems out there and planets out there. And, you know, it's just which side of the coin are you willing to, to, to flip over, really, <laughs> to believe? Right. And the other whole factor on it is time. Let's just say that, you know, yeah. in order for amino acids or whatever it is that happened that created the first singular cell or uh, however that first cell is, even if it was a, you know, let, you know I'll, I'll go through all the theories. You have, you know, there's one theory. I remember, gosh, in elementary school, they, they talked about, you know, the very first life or whatever, and they showed pictures of, like, lightning striking. And then, hey, look, there's life. Well, that's not how it happens. We do lightning strike tests all the time. We don't know at all how the first life came into being. And the time that the universe has been around, if you were to take every single right. atom across the universe and remix them every single second, the number of possible combinations you would need in order to get the amino acids to then combine into something that could then replicate itself, that would then form the basis of life, just shouldn't have happened right. probability-wise, just from the number right. of atoms in the universe. Just shouldn't have happened. So the assumption that our galaxy has life Seeing that Earth has life, that other galaxies have mm-hmm. life, is a pretty big step. Unless that yeah. comes, there's something natural that we don't know about that makes that happen, that then is able to spread across. But let's, you know, there's also the assumption that let's say Earth is the very first place to ever have life. Okay, can life get from here to other places? Well, the gravity of Earth makes that very difficult. So let's just say right, if we go right. to other places like Mars or Europa, uh, the moon of Jupiter that has. Um, has liquid water there, just because we get there and we find liquid water, that doesn't mean there's life there, but there could be life there. And if there is on mm-hmm. either of those places or anywhere else that we go, it is much more probable that life got here from somewhere else. Maybe right, a, a chunk right. of, uh, uh, you know, maybe it formed somewhere deeper in the universe that uh, got collided into with somewhere else and it, life got frozen inside of a uh, uh, ice cube of some kind, some asteroid that deep inside over, that asteroid over. that then went. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That exploded somewhere over the ocean. That that landed, and then there happened to be the right. And you know, there's also the probability that light, uh, that some life can go up into the uh, upper atmosphere. Some bacteria can go up there. Single cell organisms uh, that weigh nothing uh, that can float way up. Or let's say an asteroid hits Earth, and then part of our uh, uh, in the early development of the planet, uh, part of our mm-hmm. planet flew off deep in the space to then come and then re-hit the Earth. There's been multiple events during the creation of Earth that we could have had life, but then something happened that all life was probably extinguished. And we right, probably right. have been reseeding Earth, and this is something that I learned from Neil deGrasse Tyson's speeches. Uh, there's a probability that we, had, that we had life 
that it got extinguished, and then we replanted life, we being mm-hmm. earth, earth, earthlings. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that could be something that, you know, maybe it will, one of the things that struck Earth, that came from Earth, struck something else instead. Maybe there could be life there, too. Who knows? If we find right, life somewhere right. else, I, you can't conclude that just because we find life somewhere else that it's all over the universe or all over the galaxy or anywhere else in the solar And just the fact that we have life here on Earth doesn't mean that you're going to find it anywhere else inside the solar system. So that's a really yeah. good question that I know nothing about that I think is one of the most important <laughs> questions to ask that we absolutely, you know, that, that is like the question. And let's say that we do find single cell organisms somewhere else here within our mm-hmm. solar system. And we do decide the fact that, okay, life, anywhere that there is water, there is life. Let's just make that check mark. Okay, we, we now decide that that is now science fact. Well, how many mm-hmm. other galaxies out there have water? How many, how long have they right. been around? Are there any civilizations that, you know, we've only been on the earth for, you know, how many millions of years? Uh, life has only been right. on Earth for how many years? What about some of the plants that have been around for billions of years that have water? You know, what do those civilizations right. look like? So, you, you you know, some of these sci-fi right. movies that involve aliens are, you know, okay, I can, I can <laughs> give it to you. Highly intelligent. And, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll give it to you that there's a possibility that there are highly advanced uh, aliens out there, but then how the heck do they get to our planet, or why would they bother with our planet? I mean... If they're billion years in the future, if they've mastered space travel, that'd be like, you know, one of the things Neil deGrasse Tyson says, that'd be like us going over to a worm digging in a hole, just go, oh, man, what kind of technology is it using? We are extremely interested. We need to visit this worm. You know, <laughs> they would probably just pass us by and just go, yeah, have fun with your you know orbital, what, or orbital satellites. This concept... The concept of it makes some for some really great movies. <laughs> Absolutely. I happen to love, like, I, I just saw a, a preview. I didn't even know they were making it, that they're coming out with another um, Independence Day. Um, so, you know, I love, I love movies where there's um, not just space and science movies, but anything that involves, I don't know what it says about me, but anything that involves, like, massive amounts of, like, destruction. I think I, just, I love those yeah. kind of movies. <laughs> and so I'm really looking forward to watching this when it comes out. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't know There's another movie that I hear that's going to be coming out. There, there's um, they actually just did some filming at the Glen Research, the NASA Glen Research Center in their wind tunnel. Uh, there's going to be a movie coming out. I don't know much about it, uh, but one of the women involved in the science of the uh, Mercury program back in the 1960s, and it's the story about. Uh, her and how she was able to get involved. That's a movie I'm looking forward to. Those, those real movies that actually have um, science behind them that actually happen, that really do have really great stories, those are the movies I love. But then, of course, I like... Like historical science. precedent so, movies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> or at least, even if it's not historical precedent, that's at, if it's at least realistic and can happen, that is, that's extremely enjoyable. But when you start going into things that are ex- uh, going into black holes, I just go, okay, this, there's no basis for this anymore. Uh, let's say, okay, have you ever seen the show Firefly? I'm going to use that show as a great example. No, I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. Is is that is it good, bad, or other? I've never, I've never, I don't know much about it. I just heard the name. It lasted like a season, I think. Uh, and okay. then there was a movie. Both are amazing. Uh, it's like a, it, they take a, Western, uh, just any normal Western series, and put it in space, and it's a very weird combination of sci-fi and Western. But one of the cool things about the show Firefly is that they go all over the galaxy, go to many different planets, and but the only thing that there's uh, that there is out there are other humans, and it is a set in a time period way, way, way in the future where we've mastered space travel, but there's no mm-hmm. aliens people and we've populated many different plans we've formed trade routes and yeah but it's just people and i think wow for sci-fi what a novel thought to just have people there and just mm-hmm, how do mm-hmm. interact in a in live in a uh universe where there is no other life but people interesting <clears throat> that's so so the martian and you you gave it rave reviews you think um it was scientifically feasible 
That yeah, absolutely. Came from a good, and a good anywhere the example. author is absolute nerd, he did his research to the T of <laughs> you know what a mission to Mars would be like, and what would ha- he even like research? What would the contingency policies be if something happened? Uh, and, and yeah, he he did a fantastic job. I I don't like that the movie changed the ending of the book. That bothered me a lot. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But the science. But don't give it away because I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> Believe I, it or I not, won't. I'm ashamed I'll, I'll, to say I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> Second best movie of all time next to Apollo 13, go see it. Um, Duly noted. Duly noted. It, it, is, it is there. It is a very realistic of if we went to Mars. And what the movie actually did really well, I liked, I read the movie. I, I, sorry, I read the movie. I read the book. I watched the movie. Both are fantastic <laughs> yeah. on their own right. Uh, a lot of you know book snobs say, oh, the movie wasn't as good as the book. And I'm going, yeah, this movie is actually just as good as the book if you are general audience for shoving something down in the two hours. They captured the best parts of the book. They took out a lot of the, the sciencey, nerdy, technical. The book gets really technical, which I enjoy. And a lot of the engineers I work with, the fact that like an engineer, as actually uh, Bob Cabana, the director of the uh, Kennedy Space Center, I was at an event where he was speaking, and I got five minutes of his time mm-hmm. afterwards, I talked to him, and one of the things he did was he recommended, hey, go read this book before the movie came out. And I'm just like, okay, if a former astronaut and director of Space Center is telling me this is a good book. I should probably read this book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Definitely. It, 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 across the board, all the engineers I talked to go, yeah, that was a good book, or yeah, that was a good movie. Uh, and you don't hear a bunch of engineers saying you, that for gravity or for, um, oh, shoot, what was the other one? Not gravity, the... Um, Interstellar? Interstellar, thank you. You don't hear a bunch of yeah, engineers yeah. saying about how amazing of a movie Interstellar and Gravity were because you hear them saying how what things they did wrong or how infeasible some right. of the things were. They don't talk that way about The Martian. They talk about how amazing mm. a story it was. I'll have to go, have to go get the you, book and the movie. <laughs> absolutely. It's like a dollar on Amazon. Just, just be looking for it. It's well worth it. I put it on, I my, no uh, on my cell I phone. No <laughs> uh, I have no excuse. I I, I'm a science guy. I am a math guy. I've always been a math guy. I've never been strong in reading. Just look at my former test scores. The reading just in English has just never been my strongest topic. So <laughs> me reading a book doesn't happen all that often. Uh, but I thoroughly enjoyed The Martian and every page I read of it. It's hilarious. It is a very good sci-fi, not sci-fi. You know, it's, I guess it's sci-fi. It's set in the future. Uh, realistic yeah. sci-fi comedy. And those are the combination of things I need to enjoy something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Would you would you ever go into space if, yourself if you had the chance? If I had the chance, absolutely. They don't send very many finance people into space, though. I don't know why. I know. <laughs> it's not, not, they, they don't need many. I'm probably going to be here on Earth supporting however I possibly can. But if I had the opportunity. But, like, let's say there was a lottery program and your ticket came up, you would go. Yeah, absolutely. I'd go on any of the spacecraft. Starlink. Orion, uh, even the Virgin Galactic spaceship, whatever number it'll be at that time right now, they're doing spaceship two, uh, whatever, even yeah. in a suborbital flight, I absolutely would, no doubt about it. That would be an amazing you know, um, perspective to be in space and look down on the Earth. You know, I have to tell you, when because uh, you brought up Virgin Galactic, and actually reminded me of something um, with SpaceX that they had their, that, that vertical landing that they pulled off, um, what, like a month ago, maybe? Um, Blue Origin. It really... Are you talking about SpaceX that? or are you talking Blue Origin? Are you talking about SpaceX or Blue was, Origin that did the vertical landing? I think, I thought it was SpaceX, was it not? Okay, yeah, yeah they both have, they both have. Uh, oh, they both Blue have. Origin put one in, yeah, Blue Origin put one into suborbital flight uh, and then landed the stage back. SpaceX actually launched a payload into space uh, and then mm. landed their first stage back. So both are doing amazing things. So you're talking about the SpaceX one. Got it. I have a fantastic... Yeah. That I would love to share. Yeah, and if you I, check out my Twitter, yeah, go... There, there, there's an amazing picture I was able to... 10-minute ten, ten time-lapse picture. Uh, oh. But there's some other better ones out there, but I took a really great one. That's awesome. But, yeah, I'm sorry, go I, ahead. I remember when I watched... No, 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 I was just going to say, when I, when I first saw that footage... Um, what was so, what jazzed me up about it was, you know, you, you think about when you, when you, I was a kid and I was watching like different sci-fi movies, like even just E.T., you know, watching the alien spaceship land on the planet and, um, <clears throat> and, you know, everything that we've done th- thus far 
didn't look like that. Didn't look like right. that kind of landing. And, and, and that was what jazzed me up about it was this has reached the next level. Um, just, you know, even I know the reusability of it is, is it was the, was a big motivation, but for me, and, and it's like, you know, you look at star Wars or something like that. And they, if they have their own, ships that can go from planet to planet or, you know, do whatever. The point is that when they come back, they land a certain way. And it was something right. very, it like, it like tickled my skin watching, watching that. I was like, this is what I didn't realize I always wanted to see. <laughs> you know what? Even the space shuttle real did this really well. Let's, let, let's compare the Soyuz landing to the space shuttle landing. And I was going to say that, you know, the, the future, spacecraft we have right now are all going to be landing basically in water and they have to be recovered. But let's just compare the space shuttle to the Soyuz. Space shuttle mm-hmm. comes in, fiery landing, space plane, uh, lands on a runway, and after yeah. uh, a little bit of time, the astronauts step out of the spacecraft, walk down a staircase, wave to the, the audience, walk yeah. around the spacecraft to inspect it together, and then they're able to you know, walk in the van and drive over to you know, wherever it is, and here they are. Soyuz, right. if you watch the, the Mark Kelly landing, they're still landing in the middle of a, a tundra, frozen tundra somewhere in mm-hmm. Russia. They have to be pulled out of their spacecraft, sit down in a sofa, wrapped up in blankets, and carry, then right. they have four men carry the sofas away. And I'm just like, it's not the same. You know, it's right. just, they're in this uh, it's zero degree weather, and you don't bring zero degree clothes with you to space and back down to where you land, so you got to get like in this giant right, right. sofa and sleeping bag looking thing that just it just doesn't look right. I'm with you 100. Um, yeah. percent And then when we, you know, we're going to be landing in the ocean. There's actually some really cool technology that we did with the um, EFT1 recovery. Um, so they land in the ocean, which is again, like you said, not the same thing. You're not landing on the land just yet. And the reason why we're doing that is because You'd have to launch the landing gears and all of the systems in order to land on land. Um, right. And that weighs a lot. And that extra weight is extremely expensive when you're talking about, you know, it has to go all the way to the moon and then come back. Uh, right, so right. So there's reasons that we're not doing that, even though originally we were talking about landing in Arizona vertically and having the astronauts step out of the spacecraft and, you know, wave to the crowd. That was the originally the idea. Uh, weight mm-hmm. savings on that, though, it's just so much cheaper to land and on water and then get be recovered. Uh, in the mm-hmm. future, let's say, you know, that's, that's going to be the, what we're going to be doing through Exploration Man, EM1, um, through probably five. And then we might think about some things like reusability of the spacecraft. When you're sitting mm-hmm. in a giant ocean of salt water, it does not lend well to reusability. So at some right. point, right. spacecraft future... We're going to need to think about how can we reuse this thing and send it up in the space multiple times to bring the cost down. And there's a lot of technological right. challenges there that we haven't quite figured out that I think is worth an investment in research and development to figure out to bring costs down to make space flight cheaper, which we are currently yeah. not doing. Right now we're just trying to get the spacecraft certified to go with people on it to the moon, get some missions done. But it's definitely something we should look at in the future to land the spacecraft not in the water but on land and, you know, it, make it look exactly like it should look in the sci-fi movies. Yeah. So, but what, the really cool what, things about the uh, okay. recovery of the Orion, though, EFT-1, we actually had one of the Navy ships that has a hull uh, that recovers uh, different things and we use it for the spacecraft. And it actually sinks the entire ship down into the ocean to where water goes into the ship. And you can bring the, uh, the spacecraft floating on top of the water into the ship. The ship then raises back up, you pump all the water out, and then you have the spacecraft what? sitting there. That is what we use. It's called what? the USS Anchorage. Go look up the USS Anchorage and the recovery of the Orion spacecraft. It is really cool stuff that the Navy has. What? That's incredible. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Go, go check that out. That is, like, everyone saw the parachutes, but then they didn't see how cool it is that we recovered the spacecraft after it yeah. landed. Wow. That's, yeah, I, I have to go. I'll definitely go look it up. What, what big... USS as Anchorage. Kind of like, um, yeah, as, as, we're, as we're kind of uh, starting to wrap up a little bit here, what, what big feat would you be just completely jazzed to see come to fruition in, in your lifetime, um, whether it's um, 
at, you know, after you've long retired your career or during still while you're working there, what what big accomplishment would you like to see happen for the space? Uh, my goal is to be working there when we put footprints on yeah. Mars. And I'm not sure exactly when that's going to happen. It's supposed to be the 2030s, but that is my big goal. Is that I'm going to be around. Yeah. Uh, right now we're in 2016. Let's say it's 2036. That's 30 years from now. I'll be getting close to retirement, maybe by that point. And if not, I'm going to extend my workout until that happens. So that way they'll be like, hey, this guy was here ever since Exploration Flight Test 1. And at that time, people are going to go, what is Exploration Flight Test 1? Uh, uh, right, right. Uh, You'll be part so of the four. I'm, I'm hoping to be that guy, all right? Uh, but even before that, we need to have just a massive push by the public to understand why this is important, why we should support it, call the Congress people and say, yes, this is something mm -hmm. that we want to happen. And Congress did mm -hmm. an amazing job this year. So you have the money that NASA requests. They say, we, in order for us to stay on schedule, we need X number of dollars. Then we have our mm -hmm. president come and say, okay, I understand that you need that much, but I'm not going to give you that much. I'm not going to give you Y amount. Of, I want to give mm -hmm. you Y, which is X minus, you know, however many millions of dollars. So the president traditionally has been requesting less funding than what NASA is saying we need in order to continue developing our spacecraft to put people in space to do further explorations. Uh, and I, I find that terrible. Uh, but then mm -hmm. Congress comes back, and they're actually the ones that set the budget and just say, okay, we understand NASA wants X. Obama only wants to give us Y. But we're actually going to give you Z, which is significant, which is a couple... Uh, millions more million dollars, dollars left. More, millions more dollars than what NASA even requested. And what's amazing about that is that, you know, we put in some challenges. I mean, we, I'm not NASA. I'm Lockheed Martin. But NASA put in challenges saying we think we can stay on schedule if we can overcome some of these challenges with the number of amount of money that they, dollars that they gave. But then Congress mm -hmm. came and gave even more than that. And they just said, hey, that extra amount of money that you're giving us takes care of those challenges that we had set in stone for us that we oh, wow. So Congress gave actually more. Interesting. They gave, they gave more. Uh, so if Congress wow. keeps doing that, we will be on time. Yeah. We will be on schedule and on budget, and we will get there. If we shift yeah. to a position that Congress is matching what the president is asking for, we're just not going to get there. And if a new president so, comes in, uh, let's say Obama goes out and a new president comes in and they hit the reset button again and they say, ah, forget this whole Orion spacecraft. Let's forget – let's just do something else. They just hit that reset button or decide that we're doing changing the mission on us. Anything that can happen, it's going to set us back so far. We just need yeah. support with what we are doing. That is the main so thing. How, we are so on what the mission can, to Mars. What can my – yeah, what can my listeners who want to show you that support and do something – and help move that needle, what can they do? Call your congressman and thank them. The amazing work that they did okay. to provide us the funding that they provide us, just call them and thank them and just say, hey, we live in your district, and we just want to say we appreciate the support that you've given the space program. Please keep doing that. That is okay. all it takes. And when really you vote, yeah, when you vote there, let's see, planetary, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember, the uh, planetary resources, I think. There's a website out there that actually tracks all the things that the presidential candidates are saying about the space program. Um, and I'm mm -hmm. not going to, during your call, I'm not going to go into politics or anything like that. But there, some of the president's candidates have made quotes that are concerning. Uh, go find mm -hmm. the quotes all the different candidates have said um, about the space program. And the, the concerning part to me is how few quotes there are at all, how little people are yeah, talking about. I'm um, and how unimportant you. some of them, yeah, how unimportant the candidates have put on the space program. And you don't really do that until you're in a state where it matters. But the states that it matter, Florida, Texas, Houston. Okay, Texas is probably going to go one direction always. But um, Ohio and Colorado <laughs> and Florida are three states that are big into the space program that will have huge implications if you increase or decrease the budget. And guess what? Three states are huge swing states for a presidential candidate. It is important right. for them to start talking to these states about uh, why they would be supporting or not supporting the space program, and, and that will have a pretty good effect on quite a number of votes. Uh, but for your yeah. listeners, just call your congressman and thank them for the support that they gave the space program. We ask them to continue doing that uh, throughout their tenure there and vote the direction 
that will put other people like the ones that we currently have into Congress that specifically have voted well for the space program, uh, which I, I know that that's going to be probably not a popular thing. Congress has one of the fewest um, popularities right now of any Congress ever. But for this specific topic, mm -hmm. they're doing a really great job. Well, it's good to know. That's good to know. So thank you so much for, for that that uh, piece of homework for my listeners who, um, you know, are really going to be interested in, in helping however they can. Um, do you want to sign off the podcast for me? Uh, I'll tell you how. Sure, it's absolutely. Really easy. Oh, hey, one more thing. <laughs> Bring your kid to a rocket launch. That's oh, yeah, the other thing. Ahead. Bring your kid to a rocket launch. That's, that is one oh, of the most yeah, important things totally. that you parents do. The other side of homework yeah, assignment. Yeah, <laughs> influence the next generation. Yeah, influence the next generation to uh, also give a, a hoot <laughs> about about. Absolutely, go bring them to that and go to a cool. first robotic competition. Whatever it is, get your kids involved in the science and technology. Robotic sports will be a huge pathway uh, for for future students. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I hundred percent, hundred percent agree. Um, yeah, I. Couldn't, couldn't have said it better. So, uh, yeah, to sign up the podcast, all you're going to say is, uh, so how exactly do you pronounce your last name? Is it, is it, is it Bonzac? Is it Bonzac? How do you say it? Yeah, Bonzac. Bonzac, okay. So you're just going to say yeah. this is Barry Bonzac um, of Lockheed Martin, or however you want to introduce yourself, um, and this has been Curve the Cube. Curve the Cube. Yep. Okay, so you, you can I give it a practice run before doing it? <laughs> Yeah, go for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, are, are, we're still recording now, but do you, like, edit this, or is this all one podcast? Not really. It's Not all really. one okay, podcast. Okay, I'm just going to do, do it once then. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, this has been Barry Bonsack. You've been watching Curb the Cube. Uh, I'm going to do it again. This is Barry Bonsack from Lockheed Martin at the Orion Space Cru Spacecraft at the Kennedy Space Center, and you've been listening to Curb the Cube. Yay! Good job! You've been, seriously, you've been a fantastic fantastic guest um you're Absolutely. everything Don't i hoped you would be i was so <laughs> excited to have you on and uh, to pick your brain and you've you provided so many different insights and what was interesting is you gave a, a a very different perspective being that you're on the financial side of things and that's a lot of times something that we don't think about uh too often right. and you gave you gave people who even just are in business generally uh, some some good nuggets to chew on, and um, and of course just had my brain in a frenzy when you were talking about all the movies and and all the sciencey techie stuff. So thank you so much for being on. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, invite me back when we get closer to the uh, Exploration Mission One launch. Uh, when people start Got buzzing it. about the Orion spacecraft and what it is, yeah, invite me back, and I'd be happy to talk to you or I'm, I'm trying to think uh, what the next big milestone is going to be that I could talk about for you and we can talk a little bit more specifically just about the Orion spacecraft that'd probably be good yeah um, yeah so, absolutely so one of the things I do I, I help with the schedule we're going to be um, right now we're working on the exploration mission one spacecraft and that's going to be we're putting secondary structure which is more it, we, we get a pressure vessel from a shoot assembly facility it comes here we put stuff on it and then we go put you know, mm -hmm. put put in a, a pressure test, which basically we inflate it like a balloon to make sure it doesn't pop, and it's not going to pop while it's in mm -hmm. space. Um, right. And then after that, it goes into propulsion welding and different uh, things. But we're going to be actually receiving another Orion spacecraft. So at one point, um, starting in October-ish, we're going to be working on two Orion spacecraft at the same time wow. in the same building. So wow. that'll, that'll be definitely Hopefully cool. that doesn't get confusing. Uh, that'll definitely be cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm really yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm sure you are. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's a, there's a lot of buzz right now in my building. It's really great. It's really good to see. Uh, but yeah, as we get closer That's to the amazing. launch, for sure, invite me back, and then I can talk specifically about the spacecraft and the launch and uh, where we're going to be going from there. You got it. I promise. It's a, it's okay. A, it's a deal. I promise. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> it's Gary. been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for having pleasure. me on. You're <laughs> welcome. Right. And thank Have you for being on. One. Have a great day. <laughs> Have a good one. Bye. Bye. You have successfully curved the cube.